Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Nellie Oliensis, Chair of the Department of Classics at UC Berkeley. And on behalf of my department, I'm delighted to welcome you to the second lecture in this year's Sather Lecture Series. These are unusual times, and this is an unusual Sather series, with just two exceptions in the years 1915 and 1937. The Sather Professorship has brought a distinguished visiting scholar to the Berkeley campus every year since 1913, when it was endowed by our generous patron, Jane K. Sather. Normally, our visiting Sather professor spends a semester in Berkeley, teaches a graduate seminar, and delivers a series of lectures to be published subsequently as a book by UC Press. To take one relevant example, Mary Beard's memorable Sather series was published in 2014 under the title Laughter in Ancient Rome. What we've done this year, since we couldn't host a Sather professor in the flesh, is to solicit lectures from four former Sather professors whose work exemplifies the range and vitality of the field we call classics. The first lecture on Greek vase painting was delivered earlier this month by Francois Lissarag, our centenary Sather professor. The third lecture on the language of the gods will be delivered on March 13th by Maurizio Bettini. And this series will wrap up on April 3rd with a lecture by Mary Margaret McCabe on Plato's Republic. I should add, since there've already been questions about this in the chat, that the whole series will eventually be archived on the Berkeley Classics YouTube channel, along with a number of previous Sather series in case you want to revisit or extend your Sather experience. Now, it is an enormous pleasure to welcome back Mary Beard, Professor of Classics at Cambridge, Fellow of Newnham College, and our 95th Sather Professor of Classics to give the second lecture in this year's series. Mary Beard's scholarship is astonishingly wide ranging, encompassing Roman history, religion, epigraphy, archeology, span art history and literature, the history of the museum, the reception of classics in the modern world, the history of classical women, and the history of women in classics. The extraordinary range and depth of her scholarship is matched by her commitment to communicating the complexity and interest and relevance of classics beyond the walls of the academy. In this connection, one thing I especially value about Mary Beard is her recognition and acceptance of messiness, both in the past and in our relation to the past. Her lecture today is entitled Imperial Transgressions, Satire and Subversion in the Life of Elagabalus. Without further ado, let me turn over the little screen to Mary Beard. So we're getting used to this, um, this phrase uh, we, that we say, I must unmute myself now. And I hope I've done that. I'm sure you'll all shout. Um, I'm sure you'll all shout if you can't hear me. Um, uh, and I want to say just to start with that it is a, a huge pleasure to be virtually back in Berkeley. Uh, I wish I could be really back in Berkeley, but, you know, one day you never know. Now, I want to start with one of the slides, which you can now see, that I showed in my series uh, of face-to-face, -face, say, say, say the lectures back in the day. Um, this is The Roses of Heliogabalus by the British Dutch artist Lawrence Alma Tadema, and it was first exhibited in 1888 in London at the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition, which is a kind of rather pale shadow of the famous palette Paris Salon. Now, according to reports at the time, some visitors stood in front of this painting in the galleries and not unreasonably wondered how on earth you pronounced his name. More of them appeared completely baffled at what on earth was going on here. But for those who knew anything about early third century CE Roman emperors, the title was a good giveaway. This was the Roman ruler that historians now know generally as Elagabalus rather than Heliogabalus, but I'm going to be using those names pretty interchangeably, who came to the throne in 218 CE, aged just 14, thanks to a coup 
allegedly engineered, and there's an awful lot of allegedly's in these stories, allegedly engineered by his mother and his grandmother. In the painting here, Elagabalus reclines on the left of the high table above the other diners. He's wearing a rather smart kind of golden um, uh, sort of togary affair. Um, and his mum, Soimias, is presumably the lady just to his right. Now, the family, and here is a, a very skeletal family tree of them, just to help you out. The family came from a Mesa in Syria, which is a modern Homs. Granny, on the top left there, Julia Meiser, was the sister of Julia Domna, who was herself the wife of the Emperor Septimius Severus. But Elagabalus's claim to the throne was bolstered by his alleged paternity, not from Sextus Barius Marcellus, as you can see on the family tree, but because he was the result, it was said, of an affair between his mother and the Emperor Caracalla on the other side of this diagram. He didn't last long on the throne. Uh, by the age of 18, just four years and four marriages later, Granny, so the story went, had engineered him off the throne again and had replaced him by his young cousin, uh, Severus Alexander, or Alexander Severus, who was also, so it was conveniently rumoured, the illegitimate son of Caracalla. In one of the, the muckiest stories of imperial assassination ever, Elagabalus was supposedly killed in a latrine. The hit squad then tried to shove his body into a sewer, and when they couldn't get it in, they threw it into the Tiber. Let's go back for a bit to the painting. Elagabalus is and was in antiquity, the focus of stories, claims, and anecdotes that are striking, unexpected, not to say glaringly implausible, and in ancient terms, and I'll be coming back to modern ones in due course, hostile even by the usual standards of criticisms levelled at Roman emperors. Charges against him ranged from um, child sacrifice to choosing his advisors um, by the size of their genitals, to establishing a female senate, total no-no in Roman terms, or even never wearing the same pair of shoes twice, which is for those of us old enough to remember the real trope of Imelda Marcos. Some ancient writers specifically allege that he attempted a revolution in the religious structure of the Roman state, trying to replace or replacing Jupiter at the head of the Roman pantheon with the god Elagabal of his native Emesa, whose priest he was and from whom his name derives. Others refer to him challenging what we would now call binary views of gender, insisting, for example, according to one source, that he be addressed as a woman, and even in one account, actually asking for a surgical transition. Though, to add to the complexity here, he also had those four heterosexual marriages. He was also renowned for, and I suppose I'm putting this politely, his inventiveness as a host. Beyond any particular intricate delicacies of haute cuisine, he would, for example, serve cleverly colour-coded dinners consisting of all green food or all red food. And here, Alma Tadema captures his over-the-top generosity in showering his guests with flower petals. As often, and think here about the 
Taylor Burton Cleopatra movie, if you want, the reputation for extravagance rubbed off on the artist who was trying to recreate the Roman version of it. It was said that Alma Tadema specially imported to London at enormous expense, two boxes of roses from the south of France every week over the months that it took him to finish this painting. But there was more to this imperial tale than just spendthrift luxury. As Alma Tadema hints in the painting, there was a tragic or sadistic finale. For the petals fell in such profusion that they smothered many of the ordinary dinner guests to death. As you kind of sense from these details that some of the poor people already realize is going to happen. The woman on the right has, I think, terror in her eyes. Anyway, I'm going to give you a break from the slides for a minute, but we will go back to them um, later. The reason that I showed this picture in my lectures all those years ago was that I was talking about Roman laughter, as Nelly said, and Elagabalus's banquets were the prime context for yet another of his modern claims to fame. That is to say, his youthful, or perhaps we would say teenage line in practical jokes and inverted commas, humorous charades. It was here in these banquets that he was supposed to have tried out the whoopee cushion for the first time in recorded history, having some of his guests in, seated on inflatable cushions, which were gradually deflated during the course of the dinner, leaving them end up on the floor. And it was here in these banquets that he had a laugh at the expense of some of his themed guests, we might say, lining up eight bald men to share his dinner, or eight one-eyed men, or eight gouty men, or eight extremely fat men who made everyone else cruelly laugh because they couldn't all fit on one dining couch together. Ha ha. Now, this lecture aims to take a rather harder look as I didn't do before, at the wider phenomenon that was Elagabalus. Starting briefly with a few of his fictional recreations over the last couple of hundred years, before spending most of the time on his very, very highly charged ancient image and the modern historical approaches that have tried to inject some comprehensible sense into them. I'm not trying to uncover the real emperor. I'm more interested actually in revealing the impossibility of that project and in suggesting that the figure of Elagabalus, Elagabalus in inverted commas, if you like, can offer a magnifying lens onto the problem of the history of emperors more generally, exposing some of the faults and fault lines in our own contemporary approaches to the stories of these individual rulers. Uh, and I'm not letting myself off the hook here. I readily confess I have committed most of the historical crimes um, that I'm about to identify in the works of myself and others. But I've got something more positive in my sights too. One of the ways, as many of you will know, that we have, we've come to discuss both the truth and the fiction about Roman emperors is in terms of the ancient stereotypes of the good ruler versus the bad ruler. The one who was prudent, fair and just, uh, opposed to extravagant luxury or the free reign of libido while uh, respectfully accommodating the wishes of the senatorial class, etc., etc versus the one who was capriciously cruel, pointlessly flamboyant, sexually uncontrolled, while humiliating the upper class and pandering to the common people. 
Now, obviously, that's an oversimplification, but I'm sure many of you know and recognise what I mean. And I think there's no doubt that a sensitivity to those stereotypes of the good versus the bad emperor has helped us to read more critically what Romans had to say about their emperors and to think a bit harder about how those stereotypes were constructed. But I want to suggest that we can go a bit further. That is to say that the magnifying lens onto imperial crimes represented by the extraordinary stories told about Elagabalus can help us actually look beyond the character, the quality or the transgressions of individual emperors to open up some second order, higher level, more theoretical Roman reflections on the nature and paradoxes of the system of one man rule. We take these stereotypical Roman debates about what makes a bad emperor as more interesting explanations, what makes autocracy itself bad. I'm going to be trailing the idea that Roman writers could delineate the Roman court and the very heart of one-man rule as a topsy-turvy dystopian nightmare where nothing was as it seemed. Now, I should say at this point that some of these ideas were prompted by an article of Carlos Norania on the ethics of autocracy. Uh, so thank you, Carlos. And I've also got a lot out of uh, discussing some of these issues with my current master's student seminar uh, in Cambridge. So if any of those people are looking at this, they're going to recognize a few things in what I have to say. But back to Elagabalus. First, for a quick glimpse at how he has been fictionally recreated over the last couple of centuries, and then on from that to more strictly historical dimensions. In modern culture, he's certainly not one of those emperors like Caligula or Nero, who still have instant name recognition. In fact, um, when journalists used to call me up, and they no longer do, and ask which Roman emperor I thought Donald Trump was most like, I sometimes used to say Elagabalus, not because I thought that there was any particular close resemblance between them or any resemblance at all, really, but because I was pretty sure that the journalist in question uh, wouldn't have heard of him, and so I was forcing them to do a bit of work and go and look him up. That said, even if he's not a household name, and he isn't, we probably do underestimate some of his popular staying power, as I think did the journalists in 1888, who commented on the visitor's bafflement at the scene of Alma Tatima's painting. For actually, in mid to late 19th century Britain, his name was quite often used, at least amongst the metropolitan set, it was quite often used as a byword for luxurious dining. There was a famous French cafe on London's Regent Street, which actually had an elegabalous room within it, presumably call, called after the, the specialist haute cuisine <laughs> rather than the uh, practical jokes. And in other contexts, Helio Gabalus was a self-consciously learned, but still widely understood shorthand for the misdemeanors of tyrants. I'm going to um, go back to some pictures now. It certainly is a kind of shorthand for the misdemeanors of tyrants that he creeps into Gilbert and Sullivan's hit operetta, um, The Pirates of Penzance, which had its official premiere in New York in 1879, uh, when in the famous Major General song, the Major General proudly lists his educational accomplishments. One line runs, I quote in elegiacs, all the crimes of Heliogabalus, elegiacs there, referring to his elegiac poetry. There are plenty of wicked elegabaluses like the majors in the byways of Western literature and culture right up to the present day. And if you want a fuller review of these, um, do go to Martin Ikes's book, The Crimes of Elegabalus. 
But more striking than the crimes, I think, are the sympathetic and revisionary portraits. Those whose fictional drive is to see through the hostile ancient accounts to offer a, a more positive vision of the boy emperor. Sometimes, as in Alfred Duggan's slightly cloying family favourites of 1960, it's a rather domestic uh, rehabilitation of a kind of misunderstood, dreamy, teenaged emperor. Remember, he was only 14. But other work constructs something more challenging out of the story. Some writers and painters recreated Elagabalus as an ancestor of aesthetic decadence, a gloriously self-obsessed, but also brilliant art for art's sake kind of figure, a boundary crosser committed to a liberating version of androgyny and a heady kind of amorality. That I think is captured in Simeon Solomon's painting here, um, 20 years or so before Alma Tadema's version. Now this looks superficially as a fairly standard uh, 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 image of uh, conservative Northern European Orientalism. It's trading on the image of Elagabalus uh, as the priest of the Eastern God Elagabal. But Solomon's tragic career and his open advocacy of same-sex desire, which ultimately ended up with criminal conviction and imprisonment, I think encourages to see a rather more radical ideology at work in this painting. But even more directly confrontational, and I have to say a powerful retort to anyone who imagines that the cultural influence of the classical world in the modern has always been very tamely reactionary, more confrontational is the fictionalizing biography Heliogabalus or the crowned anarchist by the dissident surrealist Antonin Artaud published in 1934, just as he was developing the theory and practice of theatre, of cruelty, theatrical performance beyond language. The figure of the emperor Heliogabalus underpinned this. As Arto wrote in the book, Heliogabalus' whole life was anarchy in action, fire, gesture, blood, cry. And if you can't face the read, and it is, I have to say, a, pretty much an assault on the senses, um, you can get a flavour of it in the release a few weeks ago by the Norwegian rock band Arabrot, whose um, new release, The World Must Be Destroyed, is based on Arto's book. So do it if you dare. In a way, though, uh, my own favourite modern fiction is Boy Caesar by Jeremy Reed. The novel, published in 2004, features both Heliogabalus and Jim, a gay London PhD student who is, of course, writing his doctoral dissertation on the emperor. I guess it's not much of a surprising twist to find that the lives of Heliogabalus and his would-be historian begin to merge. But even so, even if it's not a particularly great work of literature, it is a very nice reminder of the connectivity of the Heliogabalus narratives, fictional and historical, because it's the historical to which I now turn for the rest of this talk, but not entirely losing contact with some of the fiction. Okay, so it's back to basics. Who are these ancient writers that I've been talking about who've given us the narrative of the boy Caesar in the ancient world? Well, apart from a few passing references, there are essentially three of them. The earliest is the senatorial historian Cassius Dio, who wrote in Greek a vast history of Rome from its origins 
to his own day. He lived through the reign of Elagabalus, but he was not in the city of Rome at the time. And he was almost certainly writing his history under the reign of the boy who replaced Elagabalus in the bloody coup of 222, his cousin, Alexander Severus. One complicating factor here is that Dio's text for this period survives only in later Byzantine excerptions with greater or lesser gaps between them. And sadly, one particularly Lachino's section is the one that preserves the reference to his request to surgically transition. The second is the historian Herodian, who wrote also in Greek, a history of Rome from the death of the emperor Marcus Aurelius in 180 up to 238 CE. He also lived through the reign of Elagabalus, but there's no sign that he was an eyewitness of what he describes and quite a lot of what he has to say, though by no means all uh, about Elagabalus appears to be drawn directly from Dio. Herodian, I, I have to warn you, has had a fairly rough deal from modern critics. The whole of his work survives, unlike Dio's. Um, and he's one of those rare historians in Roman antiquity who doesn't come from the senatorial or even equestrian elite, but he does rather sniffily and snobbishly, I think, get written off as a bit sloppy, as if we all weren't a bit sloppy from time to time. He's waiting for rehabilitation, I think. As also, in a different way, is the third main source, which is one of the most puzzling works of all classical literature to have survived. It is a biography of the Emperor Elagabalus in a long series of imperial lives, take up three volumes in a modern edition, stretching from the Emperor Hadrian at the beginning of the second century almost to the end of the third century. And it goes under the title, the Augustan, that is imperial history, or the Historia Augusta in Latin. The complicating factor in this case <laughs> is that the Augustan history claims to be a composite work by six named authors, writing at the end of the third century CE, when linguistic and other analysis has shown beyond any reasonable doubt that it was actually written by one totally anonymous author at least a hundred years after that. The whole thing is a mixture of fantasy, exaggeration, fake documents, an extremely learned knowing allusion back to earlier works of literature from Suetonius's Lives of the Caesars to, as has been claimed for the biography of Elagabalus, Eusebius's Life of Constantine. Beyond hazarding that it is some kind of satiric construction of a bored fourth or fifth century professor on an evening off, to which my response is kind of maybe, but three volumes of it? Or an attack on Christian monotheism, as some have thought, and again, can't help thinking, fine, but it's a funny way to go about an attack on Christian monotheism. We're still struggling to get even close to what on earth this satiric, ironic, fraudulent, pastiche and fake, which was something that it pretended not to be, what on earth it was for. But as it's going to play a big part uh, in what follows, let me just take uh, a few words from the life of Elagabalus by this anonymous author to show you what I mean about its intriguing and ambiguous learnedness. The author, whoever he was, is referring to Elagabalus's child sacrifice, a murderous ritual for which he insists 
that the emperor selected only those children whose mothers and fathers both were still living. Uh, in Latin, the phrase is patrimi et matrimi. Now, for anyone who works on Roman religion, that phrase is well known. Attendants at sacrificial rituals were often required to be children who were patrimi et matrimi. So it looks at first sight as if we have a nasty inverted joke here. Instead of having child attendants who had mothers and fathers still living, patrimi et matrimi, Elagabalus imposes that requirement on the child victims. But the author explains it very differently. Why, he asks, did Elagabalus choose only those whose children who had mothers and fathers still alive? Answer, he says, in order to guarantee the maximum sorrow as it would be suffered by two parents. Now, is that because our anonymous author simply hasn't got the point? He has found that nugget of information in some source, hasn't understood it, and offers a desperate first principles kind of explanation. Or is he doubling up the satire with an ironic, faux ignorant explanation of what's going on? Now, it's absolutely impossible to tell. I suspect the latter, but we just don't know. But the Historia Augusta and all the lives, but the life of Elagabalus in particular, just full of puzzles and um, semi-quotes and funny explanations like that. Anyway, quite a lot of scholarly energy in people looking at Elagabalus has been devoted to probing the differences between these three accounts. Um, Herodian, it's true, is more concerned with decrying the, in quotes, oriental aspects of Elagabalus's reign and his devotion to his eastern god, whose image in the form of an aniconic black stone, not a statue at all, but a black stone, he brought to Rome with him from Syria. It's, histor it's Herodian, for example, who tells the story that modern art historians really love about how before he had reached Rome, coming from Syria, having been proclaimed emperor there, his grandmother was worried that his priestly outfit would look a bit weird in the imperial capital. So they had a painting of him done wearing his costume and sent on a head to hang in the Roman Senate house in order to get the senators used to what the new emperor was going to look like. Dio, on the other hand, puts much more stress or more stress on Elagabalus's transgression of Roman gender norms. While it is from the biography in the Augustan history that most of the food and dining anecdotes come. Elagabalus' reign also, I think we should notice, plays a rather different role in the architecture of these different works. For Dio, it is effectively the finale to his vast 80 book account of Rome. It's the climax or the ultimate degradation of a thousand years of Roman history. In the Historia Augusta, it forms part of a pair with the biography of his successor, Alexander Severus. They both come from the same Syrian family. They're both allegedly illegitimate sons of Caracalla. They're both finally killed along with their mothers, but one is a paragon of virtue. The other is so awful that the author in a kind of jokey spurious show of reluctance says he shouldn't have committed it to writing at all. But overall, differences apart, uh, the accounts in each of these three main sources uh, are actually basically very similar. And that's partly because they're independent. They're all stuffed full of extravagant excess 
of rule breaking and casual sadism. They're also so implausible that in another wry joke, the author of the Augustan history himself observes that what he's writing can't possibly be true, but must in some way reflect the smear campaign by Alexander Severus uh, after the coup that removed Elagabalus from power. They are uniformly hostile, let me underline. The closest we come to anything at all neutral on Elagabalus in the historical tradition is in the satire on his predecessors by the fourth century emperor Julian, where Julian refers to Elagabalus, I think rather cutely, as the young lad from Emesa. That's what he says about him. But perhaps more to my point, um, these accounts have pretty comprehensively defeated any modern historian who has tried to make sense of them. That's to say, Elagabalus exposes the standard ancient historical toolkit for what it is. That is not always up to the job, certainly not up to the job here, and possibly I think not up to the job as uh, many of you I hope will reflect uh, more generally. Now, let me repeat, because I'm going to be pretty critical. Uh, I've been as guilty as anybody here, including, and I shall fess up now, I actually managed to get his age wrong in the history of Roman religion I wrote with John North and Simon Price, so I'm a fine one to talk about all this. Anyway, in general, what do modern historians do with Elagabalus and these accounts? Well, Many resort to pseudo-judicious understatement. I'm a quoting here. Elagabalus cuts an unusual figure. Inappropriate for the office of emperor to a highly unusual degree, his arrival on the throne testifies to the stag staggering sclerosis of imperial politics opens one recent account in an actually excellent general history. And again, it makes me feel like saying, well, fine, but it's not the first thing that comes to mind when you've just read all this stuff about this emperor. Others try to turn to external evidence in archeology span or documentary sources. The problem here is that as very often with supposedly bad Roman emperors, these sources tend to give a picture of the reign as pretty much business as usual. Uh, we find legal decisions in the normal way getting issued in Elagabalus's name, uh, the inscribed records of the Roman priests of the Arval Brotherhood, show them meeting throughout the reign as normal, co-opting the new emperor into their brotherhood while he appears to communicate with them in the standard way, whatever else he might have been doing in the religious sphere. So we're going to go back to a little uh, bit of picture now. In fact, Although coins are issued during his reign that clearly celebrate his Syrian deity, and you can see those on the left-hand side of this slide, and although his official titles include the priesthood of the Syrian god Elagabal, there are far more which display the usual range of ordinary Roman deities or personifications. And sometimes you can't help thinking in looking at these coins that what we're really dealing with is the orientalizing fantasies of orientalist modern scholars. Um, this coin shows Elagabalus on the left um, and on the other side of the coin, there he is and he's uh, in his Syrian um, uh, priestly costume. Whether, as some people have um, uh, claimed, that the protuberance 
on the top of the bust coming out of the laurel wreath of Elagabalus on the left hand side, whether he really is wearing a dried bull's penis on his head seems to me to be uncertain. You know, and I think we have to recognize that we're pretty invested really in turning Elagabalus um, into, in, into uh, an orientalizing fantasy. In general, actually, the religious aspects um, of uh, Elagabalus's rule, dangerous as they're treated, particularly by Herodian, are much harder to pin down than you might expect. There is no archaeological trace of the temple of Elagabal found in Homs. And the very nature of the Syrian deity, it seems to me, is obscured rather than illuminated by the kind of confident modern shorthands that we read. You know, a moon god who later developed into a sun god, you know, which I can't simply get my head around. In Rome itself, um, the uh, the emperor's new temple that he built to the god, according to all our sources, may be the large structure excavated just to the east of the Palatine Palace, or it may not be. It's identified only on the basis that it appears to be roughly the right date, and that if you try hard enough, you can reconstruct it to look like the probable images of the temple on the Elagabalan coins. Even the common assumption that young Elagabalus was plucked from years of priestly service in Syria and carted off with his god to Rome to be emperor is undercut by evidence in inscriptions and elsewhere that he probably spent most of his life in Rome in the West anyway. In general though, the underlying scholarly methods are not so very different from those of the fiction writers. That is, I think we can do away with this now, that is basically to attempt to see through the accounts we have in Dio Herodian and the rest to some other truth underneath. Now, sometimes that's on the level of kind of micro misunderstandings. So for example, the Augustan history states that one of his things he did at dinner was to let in tame lions and other animals into the dining room uh, when the drunken guests were already pretty comatose. And when they woke up and found themselves surrounded by this menagerie, even though it was tame, some of the people were so frightened, they died of shock. Not so runs one recent argument. The Augustan history here must have misunderstood the religious practice referred to by Dio of keeping wild animals, lions included, in the new temple of the god Elagabalus, Elagabal in Rome. I have to say, I'm not sure that that, um, that argument helps very much. If you look at the Dio carefully, he seems to suggest that these animals in the temple were fed on human genitals. More often, though, um, what's suggested is that there was a tendentious or willful misunderstanding by these writers of the emperor at a much bigger level. That, for example, they were blind to what was really a radical program by Elagabalus, uh, and a conscious attempt on his part to unseat conservative Roman binary gender norms, or alternatively, that all this extravagant anecdotage um, simply conceals the power politics of the reign uh, and the fact that everything was really being fixed by the Praetorian Guard. Any of that may be true, it may be true. And we are certainly, I think, coming to realize that at least in the imaginative realm, debates around ancient gender were much more fluid than most of us were taught. The problem is that we have virtually no criteria for judging the truth, accuracy, or explanatory power of these reconstructions beyond a sense of the kind of historical explanation we want to find. Basically, 
What we're doing is what modern ancient historians so often do, whether they're looking at early Rome or Hellenistic kings or whatever. We take the evidence of the surviving texts, we sieve out the bits we don't like for their sheer implausibility or whatever, and we connect the dots of what's left to make a picture of our choice. Much of the modern work on Elagabalus shows that method up for what it is, because we can't connect the dots. And it's very hard to convince even ourselves that the pictures we make are plausible. Now, in the last 10 minutes of this lecture, I want to do something different. I want to throw away the sieve, and I don't want to bother about which bits of what we read about Elagabalus are true or not. If you want my own spuriously judicious understatement, I'd say not very much of it was. The kid's only 14, for heaven's sake, but that's not the point. The point is that for whatever reason, and a lot hangs on that, these texts, Dio, Herodian, the Augustan history, are shouting at us very, very loudly, and I think we might do them the courtesy of listening to what they're saying. Now, I'm not the first to make that point, and I should say that I got a lot out of Maida's article in Classical Antiquity for 2005, who reads uh, the biography in the Augustan history very much in terms of Bakhtinian carnival, and I'm certainly looking forward to what Susanna Helm is going to say in her book. But I'm moving in a rather different direction. For me, the magnifying lens of these very shouty texts takes us to reflections about autocracy itself, although not only that. Now, I don't have time to develop this fully, but in their outrage and in the controversies they foreground, all the accounts of the emperor's reign take us beyond the excesses of one transgressive ruler into some of the most disputed hotspots of Roman culture, Roman religion, and Roman history. We get a hint of that in Herodian's story of the painting with all the issues it raises about what a Roman emperor is supposed to look like. But the stone, the lump of rock that is the an iconic image of the Syrian god Elagabal brought to Rome by Elagabalus, highlights even edgier issues that have a very long history indeed in Roman history. I'm surprised that when scholars write about this throne and about this stone and about Elagabalus' installation of it in his new Palatine temple, they very rarely stress that only a few hundred yards away at the other entrance to the Palatine, there was already an aniconic stone image of a supposedly Eastern deity that had been brought to Rome 500 years earlier at the end of the third century BCE. I'm talking of the black stone of the great mother imported from modern Turkey, along with her self-castrated, self-flagellating priests in the middle of the war against Hannibal. I've argued before, that Roman controversies around the worship of the great mother, her image, and perhaps above all her priests, who were both, I think, simultaneously embraced and rejected by Rome, that this cult raised much bigger questions about the boundary between the Roman and the foreign, about what counted as Roman and about Roman masculinity. In the stories of Elagabalus, those debates are given an added urgency because the emperor himself is now the priest. My sense is that accounts of the reign of Elagabalus offer in the figure of the emperor a, a kind of degree zero of Roman autocracy and its paradoxes, partly signalled by his quasi-namelessness. Now, you may have noticed from time to time me saying things like, the emperor we know as Elagabalus. The fact is, that so far as we can tell, he was never called that 
or Heliogabalus during his lifetime. Those are later constructions based on his patron deity. But more than that, we can't really pin a name on this kid at all. Dio stresses this when he opens his account of the reign with a list of the emperor's nicknames from Sardanapalus, the semi-mythical Assyrian king, also reputed to have challenged gender stereotypes, to Tiberinus from the river where the poor kid ended up. His official imperial titles, which were taken from Caracalla, were, as Dio says, also a false name because he wasn't really the son of Caracalla. And the author of the biography in the Historia Augusta makes the obvious move to say that his birth name, Varius Avitus Bassianus, is a sing signal of plurality and uncertainty. Now, other names, other emperors were widely known by their nicknames, Caracalla, for example, from his cloak or Caligula from his shoes, but this is extreme in what we have here, the almost complete nominal disaggregation of imperial identity. But now, to end, what are the second order reflections on autocracy that I promised? And that means digging a bit into the apparently random anecdotes about the eccentric behaviour that fills especially much of the life in the Historia Augusta, the quips about the shoes, about what he served at dinner, or the mountains of snow that he procured for his summer gardens and so forth. My point is that these are not half as random as they look but follow a number of logical threads, which taken together amount to a characterization of autocracy and of the imperial court as a peculiar sort of dystopia in which the rules of nature and the social conventions of meaning are flouted or suspended, in which nothing is as it seems and you can never believe your eyes. As one of the students in my master's seminar put it rather nicely, autocracy here destroys autopsy. The flouting of the rules of nature is clear enough and repeatedly seen in his dining and his lifetime. It's not just having piles of snow in the summer gardens, but he never eats seafood when he's by the coast, but only inland. And he fills his inland swimming pools with seawater and he sleeps during the day uh, and wakes and works at night. Now, in a way, yes. Uh, living in accordance with nature is one of the tropes of elite Roman morality. But here it is recrystallized around imperial power and transgression. More insidious, though, is the smoke and mirrors that defines life in the imperial palace. One of Elagabalus' tricks, we're told, is to invite lots of guests to his banquets but to serve real food only to the elite and fake food made of wood or wax to the lower status guests. So they had what looked like a delicious meal in front of them, but it was entirely inedible. Elagabalus wasn't the first Roman to play that trick. There were earlier complaints about it. But in this case, it is part of a complex web of sensory destabilization of which the emperor is at the center. His lions are tame, but they kill you nevertheless. In conservative Roman terms, though I stress not ours, he is a man but claims to be a woman. He is, as the writer of the ancient biography sums it up, as fake as his name, but it goes even beyond fakery, to undermining the very nature of what representation and reality are. One passing accusation in the biography is that whenever adultery was shown on the stage, Elagabalus made the actors really do it. Of course, uh, the implication could be that he just wanted a more sexually explicit show, 
But the more important logic here is that in Elagabalus's dystopian world, the distinction between representation and reality is forgotten or confused. The transgressive power of autocracy breaks the social rules of meaning by literalizing also metaphor and symbol. That's very clear in the religious symbolism of his world too. When Elagabalus wants to link his Elagabalan cult to the sacred flame of the goddess Vesta at the very heart of traditional Roman religion, tended by six Vestal virgins, what does he do? He marries a Vestal virgin, as it were concretizing the complexity of religious symbolism in the banality of human sex. We haven't actually a clue, I have to say, finishing now, what happened under Elagabalus. But I've been suggesting that these larger than life transgressive fantasies should push us beyond the individual ruler to a Roman discourse of autocracy beyond the autocrat and to the hints of a Roman formulation, incohate to be sure, of what is the matter, not just with a bad emperor, but with imperial power itself. Along these lines, autocracy subverts not only nature, but the social conventions of meaning and representation. It trades simultaneously in pretense and play acting where there should be truth and in misconstruing the language of symbol as if it was sensible reality. Now, Roman imperial history, if you think about it, is full of this. Fake captives in fake triumphal processions, Caligula insisting that those who had vowed their life for his recovery from illness really should kill themselves, and so on. But it was already there with the first emperor, Augustus, whose famous last words compared his role as emperor to that of actor. If I've played my part well, he says, clap me. At the center of Roman anxieties over one man rule is the simple worry that the emperor was an actor and that the empire, the autocratic system was all about fakery. And that to finish with finally, going back to Al Matadama, that I think is a point that he sort of got in this painting. This is not just a painting of a luxurious display gone wrong. It's a painting of a dystopian world in which the meaning of human interactions has gone so far awry that what appears to be generosity is actually deadly. This is kindness killing. Now, did anyone see that in 1888? I'm not sure. In fact, this was one of the paintings that hung in the gallery where the members of the Royal Academy had their own slap up dinner in the presence of British royalty to celebrate the annual exhibition's opening. At two meters across, more than, it was pretty dominating above the tables. There's an irony there, but did any one of them spot it? I don't think so. They certainly didn't point it out. Thank you very much. The end. Thank you, Mary. It's one of the weird things about this format is that the thunderous applause that should have greeted the end of your lecture was actually total, you know, just <laughs> silence. But thank you so much. This is, uh, know it, you know, is everybody asleep? You were <laughs> no, Did anybody? I was, you know, I was, I was <laughs> <laughs> I was desperately trying to, you know, uh, make, you know, un, un blank myself again without much luck. But so these things do happen. Now, I want to say before everyone, uh, the thanks are rolling in uh, virtually through the chat. But I wanted to say that um, Mary Beard has kindly offered to take some questions. We have time for, you know, a few. Uh, one question came in earlier, and I don't know who because the I can't scroll back up at the chat. Uh, but I think you kind of answered this 
perhaps toward the end, but the question had to do with whether you thought that the popularity of this figure and sort of 19th century fin de siècle art was connected to this whole issue of gender fluidity and so forth. I mean, it is. Yeah, I think it must be. I mean, I think that um, the if anybody wants to explore this, um, Ike's book on the crimes of uh, Elagabalus uh, has drawn together, I think, much more impressively the modern work about fictional work about Elagabalus than than the historical background. Um, and so, um, although it's a bit of a list, you can actually find all sorts of things to explore. And it is it is really clear that within you know nineteenth century self conscious decadence, um, a selective reading of what Elagabalus did, and it has to be pretty selective. Um, somehow, you know, as Arto gets, you know, the idea of. Um, the kind of the uncompromising face to faceness with uh, life, androgyny, and art is something that you can. I mean, so you have to work quite hard. I mean, I don't think if if you go away and read Dio Herodian uh, and the Historia Augusta, that will instantly pop out. But you can see that it's waiting there for someone to say, "No, look, there's the logic I want to put on this." is is this one i mean i think we're always in a really difficult position here and i suppose this is where you know the fi fiction and and the his historical accounts are doing much the same really then that you know they are desperately trying to to kind of create something mm -hmm. um which has a which has a point to it. Now, part of me thinks that one of the appalling crimes that modern historians wreak on the ancient world is never let, you know, always insisting that they're sensible. You know, we never let it to be just nonsense. You know, yeah. could we let antiquity occasionally be nonsense? Yeah. No, we always have to find the bloody sense in it, right? Yeah. But, uh, you know, assuming that, you know, I, you know, I'm as hooked on finding the sense in the nonsense. Um, you know, it is, this is a, a, a concatenation of stuff which lets you see decadence there and 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 very clearly androgyny. Okay, thank you. I've got another question and I'm sorry they're flying by. So my apologies to all the people who are asking questions that I'm losing track of. Here's one. Uh, if it was a worry about autocracy, what do you do with the over-the-top virtue of Alexander Severus in the very next biography? And isn't the worry ah, and isn't the worry about autocracy autocracy ours rather that than that of a satirical writer of the fourth or fifth century? Aha. Uh -huh. um, I think that you could say, I think in the pairing with Alexander Severus, I mean, I, I think the point is it doesn't work, does it? You know, Alexander is the paragon, but he's also killed with mum. <laughs> so there is a real parallelism here where uh, and they are, I mean, we are meant to read them together. Um, and we're meant to read them together because in these fictionalizing, the fictionalizing authors, yeah. they're the same, it's both, is Lampridius for both these. Um, so someone is wanting to make us see it together. Um, and, and I think that what I, I, I haven't thought so hard about Alexander Severus, but I think the fact that the end result's the same is, is hugely important. And on the question of whether the worry about autocracy is ours or not, I mean, of course it is, you know. Um, I mean, why am I interested in this? Because I'm worried, you know, because I'm worried about autocracy. Um, so, you know, I've got to plead guilty to be it being mine. I suppose, though, I would say um, we have got much too used, I think, to saying, Romans took autocracy for granted, and the only thing that they were bothered about was whether this emperor was good or that emperor was bad. Now, somewhere in here, and I'm not sure if I'm there yet, but I think somewhere in this idea of dystopian fakery, there is a Roman version of a critique of autocracy. You know, I think it's a fuzzy one, and I think it's an incohate one, um, but I think they're at it more than we like to give them credit for.
you know, it's a bit like saying, you know, Romans aren't interested. Well, I mean, this would be extremely old fashioned view, but, you know, I, I was brought up with Romans not being interested in philosophy, you know, and you think, what the hell is the Roman law codes about other than political philosophy from start to finish? But we put it down, we leave it to legal historians. So I want to say, if we thought differently about what a critique of autocracy might look like, then we can find it here. Great. Um, another, there just another question. I think we have time for maybe this and possibly one more. Do you think there's a re and here's? Do you think there's a reason that we know so little about this particular emperor? And I guess the implication there is that we actually know a bit more about some others. Is there something distinctive? Do, do we distinctively know less about him? And if so, do you have any thoughts on that, I guess? Well, I think there's plenty of, you know, by the time you get into the third century, there's plenty of emperors about whom we know little. But, but I would say, I think what's significant about this one is that he's the kind of empty center. And I'm, I'm not quite sure why I think this, but he's the empty center into which all this garbage about, um, uh, transgression, autocracy, what it's like, gets poured. Um, that's no doubt is something to do with what the Historia Augusta writer said, you know, it's to do with the smear campaign afterwards, but it's, it's somehow, there's, there's, a, there's more going on there. I mean, it is partly Dio's end. How does Dio's history end in Rome? Well, he sort of gets up to Alexander Severus, but he's writing in the rain. It ends with the kind of fantastic explosion of what autocracy is. So there's a constructive use of the vacuum here, where in other places the, the, it's, it's, it's treated less interestingly. The, the fact they're all piling in on this, the fact, the fact that it is so, um, I mean, as I said, the fact that they're kind of shouting so hard shouldn't be the prompt to us, I think, to say, so what really is going on? It should be to say first, so what are they talking about? Um, another question uh, that has come up is, so on the one, you, you've talked about gender fluidity, which is clearly a really you know, central concern to this. And you ended by thinking about fakery and representation and reality. And is there, a, is there fluidity in the representation reality? I mean, is there a kind of a, a step from there? I mean, I, you know, I think, yes, you, you could, that would be one way to go because all these stories about lions and, um, you know, the, the you know, actually, is a lion ever tame? You know, so oh, we had tame lions. We were frightened. Well, and I think that part of the the kind of the topsy turvy world that you get inside that's constructed inside the palace is you don't know um, you you have no way of judging what's fake and not fake. So it's it's so it's not as simple as saying. Um, Oh, right, okay. Uh, like I made it seem a bit, you know, this is this is generosity, but it's killing. You, you, the, all your elements and methods of judgment are, pr are, are useless. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's not just that you must disbelieve what you see. It's just you, ha there are no criteria within this world of, of at the very center, you get to the very heart of one man rule, you wouldn't know what the criteria of truth was. So it's, I mean, I, I was, I think, doing it in a rather functional and um, slightly oversimplified way. I think it's a sort of, it's a kind of atopian mixture of, um, of an inability to know what could possibly be what made up of all sorts of bits of, you know, sure, of earlier Roman um, morals and ethics, etc. You know, there's, you know, there's, you could do some of this on Trimalchio, um, yeah. you know, if you want to. Yeah, thank you. And a letter one, two, two would be, you know, another good starting place, you know. Yes, I mean, I love the fact this does feel like the culmination of something that's just everywhere, like the most 
it, yeah. you know, in, intensified crystallized version of something that's just all over the place. Um, I was going to say <laughs> with some anxiety over the figure, you know, you've given us a lot of food for thought, uh, which I think is in fact the case, but I think we should really let you go at this point and we can't really applaud as a group. So you'll just have to I'll take it from myself. Me. <laughs> and, and that's right and, and you'll see it's a wonderful it. gavelin thing to do she then claps that's, that's right um yes and um thanks to the audience for coming and and joining Thank us you. yes and i hope many of you will come back on march 13th to hear marzio bettini a phenomenally interesting uh scholar so and also yes all these things will be on our youtube channel uh and you can find them there and you can watch again and we can go through this whole thing again and again if we like. So thank you so much, Mary. We're so grateful to you for coming and talking, talking okay. with us. Thank you to all the people I can't see, but I know must be there. Okay. Bye everyone.